Okay, everybody, we're going to move on to some more infectious diseases here. These, again, are some of the more lower yield. However, I'm going to point out a couple of these because they are actually more medium to high yield. So, um, you know, this is stuff you're going to want to have at least a passing familiarity with for step two and step three. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the i button in the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you very much who have already donated. And certainly feel free to subscribe to my channel and you'll get updates uh, and notifications as I put more and more videos up. So we're going to talk about a couple of viral disorders. In the original, the old video, I actually included Kaposi sarcoma in under the viral diseases. However, I have moved that over to the upcoming video that I'm going to do on HIV, AIDS, opportunistic infections. It fits better there. Um, and then we'll talk about some tick-borne and parasitic diseases here too. Okay, so we're going to talk about Dang first. Um, so dang fever, is, some people call it dengue fever. Um, I like to pronounce it the French way. Uh, this is a systemic infection that occurs in immunocompetent people. Okay, so common. Um, unfortunately, I had a friend, well, I have a friend, who his wife went down to, they, they were going to go to Costa Rica, and then they, she stopped in Mexico first. By the time she got to Costa Rica, she was in a ton of pain. They admitted her to the hospital there, and she had dang fever. Um, he wanted to bring her back to the United States for treatment, and I'm like, mm -mm, don't do that. We never see dang fever here. So uh, keep her down in Costa Rica. They're used to it. Uh, the cause here is a virus, the dang virus. The symptoms here, severe, severe fever, very high fever, and this is often caused called break bone fever because it causes arthralgias, myalgias, bone pain. Um, so remember break bone fever. And then it also causes this characteristic modeling rash. And I'll show you a picture. So you've got a patient who's in Mexico, in South America, and they uh, have severe pain, high fever, and they're otherwise healthy, probably dang fever. Um, there are some other unusual things that you can see, uh, hyponatremia, you can get uh, depression of, uh, of platelets and white cells, um, they can have elevated liver enzymes, but you're certainly not going to see all of these. Um, the treatment here is just supportive. This is that rash that you'll see. So you got bone pain, arthralgias, a rash like this, and you're sitting in Mexico, it's dang. Molluscum contagiosum is very, very common. It is a skin infection and it causes these little papules. So basically what these look like is these little pearly, shiny lesions and they have a little umbilicated portion in the center. Once you see one, you'll remember it forever. There may be some surrounding inflammation and because of that, it can come with some itchiness, but typically these don't hurt. Often patients don't even come in for it, but they may notice it. And a lot of times they're going to say, doc, I have a wart. And it's not really a wart um, because it's not caused from HPV, um, but it is caused from a pox virus. And that is molluscum contagiosum. So it shares more in common, I suppose, with smallpox than it does with uh, regular old warts. But uh, again, this is not severe. It doesn't even necessarily need treatment. Uh, the treatment here is just observation or elective removal, patient's choice. However, if the patient is immunocompromised, you're going to want to treat the underlying cause. So if you've got a patient with HIV AIDS who develops a lot of these, check their CD4 levels and get their CD4 levels up because they're probably low. This is what it looks like. You can't mistake it. I and mean, look at that little umbilication right there. You see these here and here and here. And it's, they're so common. They happen in kids. Technically, it is an STI, uh, but you can get it in a variety of ways. It does not have to be sexually transmitted. So sometimes they can uh, crust over an ulcer, especially if they're itchy. Okay, so now we're going to talk about Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. This is bacterial. However, it's carried by ticks. Um, it's often seen in the spring and summer because this is due to outdoor exposure and camping, and that's usually when people go outside. It's caused by rickettsia rickettsii. 
Um, the symptoms here are going to be a fever and a headache, flu-like symptoms. Sometimes they can come down with uh, more CNS symptoms, but typically it's going to be a fever and a rash. And this is classically described as a centripetal rash. Okay, and that's gonna be different from Lyme disease, which this can look like Lyme disease, uh, but with Lyme disease, remember, we see erythema migrans, the target rash. Whereas here, where you're going to have a maculopapular rash that's centripetal. So it starts in the hands and feet and spreads its way to the trunk. The best test here is IFA. However, that is not an option on CCS. So what you should go with here is rickettsial disease agglutinins. That is an option on CCS. The treatment here is doxycycline, which is usually the right answer when you're talking about something that comes from a tick or an animal. Q fever, Lyme disease, etc. You have to use doxycycline in all patients with Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, including those under the age of eight. And that's in contrast to, uh, to Lyme disease where you can go with amoxicillin, you should go with amoxicillin for uh, patients under the age of eight. Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever is also called the great imitator because it can look like a lot of other things. Note Lyme disease. Lyme disease though has a different kind of rash. And then meningitis. These patients with RMSF can get meningeal-like symptoms. Uh, however, meningitis does not cause this kind of rash. You can get a little rash with meningococcal meningitis, but those patients are going to look really, really bad. Those patients are often septic because by the time you get a rash, you generally have meningeococcemia. This is the centripetal rash that I was telling you about. Let's see how it's maculopapular here, and then ultimately it spreads to the trunk. Ehrlichiosis is very unlikely to come up on your exam, but it is worth mentioning. This is a flu-like syndrome that also happens in the summer due to exposure to various ticks. Um, so it does look similar to Lyme disease as far as the presentation, where you have this nonspecific flu-like syndrome in a camper or hiker. However, it does not cause a rash at all. This is caused by Ehrlichia chafensis, which is going to be more in the north of the U.S., or Anaplasma phagocytophyllum, which would be more in the south. Um, the labs here, again, remember, you're always going to be getting your, um, your, your routine labs. And it's going to help you. Uh, thrombocytopenia and leukopenia. And this is going to be in contrast to babesiosis, which we'll talk about. So low platelets, low white counts. They can also have elevated transaminases. We do not see that in Lyme disease. Your platelets and white count are going to be more or less normal in Lyme disease. The test of choice here is actually a peripheral smear. So along with that CBC, you're going to get a smear. And what you'll see is inside the white blood cells, you'll see morula. And the treatment here is doxycycline. It comes from a tick. This is what it looks like here. So here you see a granulocyte and you see this little morula here. It looks like a little blueberry. And then here you can see it in what appears to be a monocyte and you can see multiple of them. Again, they look like little blueberries or raspberries or blackberries, whatever you want. Okay, now we're gonna talk about babesiosis. This is again, very similar to Lyme and to Ehrlichiosis, um, but there are some major differences. So it's carried by the Exodes tick. So for that reason, you can be co-infected with both Lyme and Babesiosis, which would suck. Um, the pathogen here affects, infects the red blood cells. And so this can cause a hemolytic anemia. So it's similar, again, in presentation to Lyme's and Ehrlichiosis, where you get this flu-like syndrome, very nonspecific. However, you're going to have this hemolytic anemia um, that so if you get a CBC, you show a low hemoglobin. Anytime you do that, you're going to be getting, you know, uh, you, you want to be getting um, more labs to ascertain the cause. Check your total bilirubin and all that stuff. And you'll have a hemolytic anemia picture. The test of choice here is a peripheral smear. Why? Because babesiosis is visible in red blood cells. What you'll see is something called the Maltese cross inside the red blood cells. And that makes sense because this infects the red blood cells, whereas their leukiosis was the white blood cells. Um, so consistent labs are going to be obviously consistent with hemolytic anemia. So uh, increased uh, indirect bilirubin, a reduced haptoglobin, elevated LDH, liver enzymes can also be elevated. The treatment here is clindamycin and quinine. Remember that this is... Uh, this is um, 
these two. Um, quinine is uh, often given for malaria. And remember, malaria also affects red blood cells. So that's one way that you can think of it. So this is the Maltese cross right here. It's not perfect, but it kind of looks like a cross. You can Google more pictures if you want. Okay, finally, enterobiasis, also called pinworm. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of this. You probably encountered it. This is a helminthic infection that usually happens in young kids. This is going to come up on your exam as a five-year-old whose butt itches. And often their siblings' butts are going to be itching too, and maybe even moms and dads. It is associated with poor hygiene, but it doesn't have to be. It comes in outbreaks, though. The cause is enterobius vermicularis. The major symptom here is anal pruritus. Girls or women can have vaginal pruritus. And then you can get insomnia just because this tends to get worse at night, and so it's going to be hard to sleep. I mean, if my butt was itching all night, I probably wouldn't sleep either. Uh, physical exam is pretty nonspecific. You may note some perianal or vaginal redness. Uh, so to diagnose this, it's very old-fashioned, but it works really great. Um, so it's what, what you do is when the patient wakes up, you have mom or the patient uh, go in with a piece of tape and just kind of dab the anal area and then put that into a baggie and bring it to the doctor and we can look under a microscope for eggs. The treatment here is albendazole, and then we also are going to treat family members because more than likely they have this. This is a, a vicious cycle. The eggs come out uh, of your you-know-where, and then little kids itch, and what do kids like to do after that? They like to eat, and they don't wash their hands. So this is a matter of hygiene, but we do treat this with albendazole. And then this is just a recap. We did not talk about Kaposi sarcoma, but we will talk about that in the opportunistic disease uh, talk.